Today, we have uh, luckily one of the speakers that is in town for the conference uh, very graciously uh, is willing to come speak to us. I, I saw his name because, of course, like all of us, hopefully we read the Freeman, the, um, the uh, magazine of the Foundation for Economic Education. Carl Oberg is here with the they do a great job. They've been publishing that for many, many years. And I saw an article, which I completely plagiarized uh, for our event today, Concierge Care for the Little Guy. And we all heard of concierge care, usually for rich people. They had their own doctor. I don't know if you watch the, the TV show, The Royal Pains. This is about a, a concierge doc in up, upstate New York that, you know, basically a personal doctor for a bunch of rich people. And now through technology and innovation, this kind of service quality of care is available and affordable for all of us. And I really think this is one of the keys to really revolutionizing health care. You know, what we've done in health care policy, really moving the, the chairs of the Titanic. If you ever looked at cost projections with and without Obamacare, they all look like this. Completely unaffordable. And it's going to bankrupt our country. And unless we come up with innovative ideas like this one and change the way we're doing things, we're never going to solve the problem. And we're going to be talking about alternatives to expanding Medicaid. You know, Medicaid is not great coverage. Uh, we don't think we all spend a tremendous amount of money to expand poor coverage where you can't, have, can't even find a doctor. But this is a way that we could expand coverage to low-income Georgians, give them access to better care and affordable price that's sustainable. So we're very pleased. Um, Dr. Lee Gross is here with us today. You have his bio there on, on your desk. And uh, no further ado, please welcome Dr. Lee Gross. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Uh, if you look in the middle of your table, you'll see a, a brochure from our practice. We set those out there, so you might want to take, uh, take a glance at those if you get a chance. Uh, as Kelly said, my name is Lee Gross. I'm a primary care physician. I'm presently practicing in Southwest Florida. Uh, originally from the greater Cleveland area, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Did my undergraduate at Ohio State University. Uh, went on to uh, University Hospitals, uh, Case Western Reserve. Uh, did my medical school training and uh, spent a few years doing research at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and the cardiology department, getting investigational devices and drugs, FDA approval. Uh, and went back and finally decided to go into primary care and uh, put out my shingle in Southwest Florida where I've been practicing ever since 2002. But as any physician will tell you, a lot's changed in medicine, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. And it's become so burdensome to be, to be in the primary practice of medicine, the paperwork just gets absolutely crazy. Um, to the point where you're basically no longer interacting with the patient, you're just a, a cog in the wheel doing what the insurance companies are telling you to do for the patient and making sure that, that you're following the care paths and nomograms and your electronic health records are checked off. Um, and it got to the point where it just was absolutely no fun anymore to be practicing medicine. Uh, you were no longer, you know, if you would look and see how many people were actually in that room with you and the patient uh, between the insurance executives and the, the nurse care managers and all the, the people making health care policy. There's so many people in that patient interaction that it was no longer a patient interaction anymore. And we used to sit down with my friends at the end of the week, uh, sort of like the uh, people uh, uh, at the end of uh, the show where the, the, uh, the two attorneys at the end of the week sat down with their glass of scotch and cigar and just lamented over the uh, over the course of the week, that's sort of what we would end up doing at the end of the week and just commiserating how we could change this and how we could do something a better way. And we've managed to put together a program that we're pretty excited about. And I'm going to tell you all about it here. Uh, over the course of the past several years, I've had many opportunities to go to Washington and meet with members of Congress uh, with Docs for Patient Care. And we've showed them the kind of package we've put together. And we would sit down and I would have this flyer and I hand it to one of the members of Congress uh, and I'd say, if you could design an ideal health care reform, you would probably put together a package that makes primary care and basic care available to access to anybody for a cost that almost anybody can afford. You'd want to have total price transparency so you knew to the penny what your care was going to cost 
uh, before you actually receive that care. You'd want that, that health care to be a, uh, something that you take with you, whether you lost your job or whether you wanted to change jobs, uh, it would be portable. You'd want to encourage people to go into primary care and, and boost up that and make it a viable, uh, a viable specialty for people who want to go into it. Uh, you would want to make it so it didn't exclude for pre-existing conditions. And, and uh, I said, you know, you passed a 2,700 page law and have written about 50,000 pages of regulations and accomplished almost none of those things, but in the two-page flyer that I have, we accomplished all of them. Um, the congressmen look back and forth and they say, well, this is fantastic, but it's far too simple. <laughs> um, and it is, it's far too simple. So, what was the epiphany? You know, what was it that finally brought us to the point where we created this? Uh, one day, a uh, a patient of one of my friends who owned the heating and air conditioning business came up to him after the offices and said, you know, I have 10 employees and all 10 of my employees see you as their doctor. My insurance just went up almost to $1,000 per month per employee. And instead of just paying all the money to the health insurance company, why don't I just pay you directly for your services? Then I'll purchase a catastrophic policy, a high deductible policy. And even if I paid that high deductible or catastrophic policy, I'm probably still going to come out ahead. At the, end of the, at the end of the year by skipping, paying all that overhead to the, to the insurance company. Because what we do in primary care is cheap. You know, we're, selling our, we're selling our brain time. That's not big ticket stuff. I'm not putting in uh, a $10,000 hip orthotic. I'm not putting in a $100,000 pacemaker. I'm using a $1.50 hypodermic syringe and some table table, table, table paper. So, you know, why does this have to be so expensive? People can say, health care is so expensive. No, actually, health care is not real expensive. It certainly doesn't have to be. Health insurance is very expensive. But what we're learning with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act is that health insurance and health care are two completely different things. But somehow we have the opinion that if somebody has health insurance, they have health care. And that's, that's not true. Uh, so when we you know, go around the country, we talk to these different legislators, and, and we have Republicans saying, repeal and replace. Well, repeal and replace, but with what? And I hear high deductible health plans and health savings accounts. Well, that's great, but if you've done nothing to bring down the cost of health care, you've only given them a card, but you've not given them access to any care. Uh, and we've actually seen that because, you know, with conservative people running around talking about them, that's what they like. They like high deductible health plans. And now the Affordable Care Act rolls out, and you look at the policies on the exchanges, and guess what? They're all high deductible health plans, and we should be doing backflip. Well, no, because we've done nothing to, to actually make care affordable for routine services. So people are still <coughs> doing way getting things done, except for the, the freebies that are included in these expensive high deductible policies. So we have to find something to fill that gap that allows a high deductible health plan, a health savings account, to actually work properly so people still don't avoid getting routine care and treating their chronic conditions so we can keep them from getting sick. And we believe that we've done that. So we've actually started to delve into this and see where are the true cost drivers you know, if I wanted to create just a simple primary care model that I could do basics, all basic care, what do I need to make that work? Well, I need access to affordable labs, I need imaging services, I probably need some physical therapy, I need some, some affordable pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so we started to research these things and find out how much these things actually cost and if we could actually bring the cost of these things down. So I would approach various uh, providers in the area and say, if a patient agreed to pay for, your, for their care or your services at the time of service, you didn't have to bill them, try to collect them, deal with an insurance company, what could you sell your services for? Name a price. I don't care if it's high, low, just tell me what it is and, and we're going to put it on a piece of paper. You're going to sign an agreement with me and I you to just guarantee you'll offer that price for at least a year and notify me if you change that price. But I just want to know in advance what it is. And the prices were insane. You'll see some of those things uh, in a little bit. So we did create, what we created was a membership-based primary care program. It's a flat rate. Uh, it's sort of like joining a health club. When you pay your, your monthly fee at the health club, you don't pay to go and use the fitness equipment. You don't pay to use the sauna. You just go and you utilize the services, uh, but your, your flat monthly fee doesn't change. And that's basically what we've done. It's just a flat fee service. We've been able to bundle all the regular services that somebody would routinely need, so we include uh, Routine lab, lab work in there. We include for women pap tests, mammograms, uh, 
all the routine vaccinations that people need in that flat monthly fee. So we all know how the free market works. A flat screen television comes to market, that's, that television might come in at $750. And as time goes on, more people start making these flat screens, they start competing, and price comes down a little bit, they learn how to make it better, they learn how to make it cheaper, the technology gets better, and before you know it, that same television is now a, a, a Black Friday special at Walmart. That's certainly what happens in free market healthcare. No, actually this is what happens in free market healthcare. <laughs> But why is that? You know, you have mega hospitals across the street from each other competing against each other. I mean, there's certainly, there's certainly competition in the marketplace. There's no question about that. So why is the competition in healthcare not driving the cost down? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we fix the prices in healthcare. So say, for example, you had competing hospitals that put in pacemakers. And you have one hospital that puts in a $100,000 pacemaker, and they start putting a lot of them. A hospital across the street says, wow. There's a pretty good margin in, in the pacemakers there. We probably need to ramp up our, our cardiac, maybe put in another cath lab, uh, and hire another cardiologist, and now next thing you know, we've got two hospitals putting in $100,000 pacemakers. Uh, you have device manufacturers saying, you know, these guys really sell a lot of pacemakers, maybe we should start developing pacemakers, or maybe we need to look for new indications to put in pacemakers. Uh, and so now you, you have a whole bunch of people putting in Expensive pacemakers, but nobody actually bringing down the cost of healthcare. Probably another even better example is uh, comparing cataract surgery to LASIK eye surgery. LASIK eye surgery is a corrective vision procedure done by an ophthalmologist in the surgery center. Cataract surgery is, of course, the same a, a surgical procedure done by the same surgeon in the same exact facility. But the difference between the two is LASIK eye surgery is considered cosmetic, it's considered elective, and it's not covered by most insurance and cataracts is covered by most insurance. Well, if you saw the, uh, the numbers recently released by Medicare about how much ophthalmologists make in the United States, you'll see how profitable cataracts are and how much that costs the country. Uh, but the price of cataracts has not come, cataract surgery has not really come down. It has maybe it's been forced out a little bit. Uh, but if you look at LASIK, you could go on Groupon and get a buy one, get one free, and probably get a little right to the, to the facility. <laughs> uh, that's the difference in the services you get between paying out of your pocket and somebody else paying that bill, bill for you. So, so why is insurance so, insurance so expensive? Well, nowadays, insurance isn't insurance anymore. Insurance used to be protection against an unexpected loss, uh, where you can use actuarial figures and see what it is. But now, insurance is required to bundle absolutely everything into it. Uh, especially even now more so under the Affordable Care Act for first dollar coverage for your colonoscopies and for every preventive service. Uh, and if we expected our homeowner's insurance to act in the same way we're expecting our health insurance, where every time a light bulb burnt out, you'd file a claim, or every time you had to mow the lawn, you'd file a claim, every time you had to sweep it, every time you had to paint it. But, I mean, these are routine expenses with homeownership that you should expect to be able to, to provide out of your pocket, and those things should be affordable. But with the traditional health insurance, all those things have to be bundled in there, but we've also not made them affordable. Well, that last sentence down there, since I see both tradi traditionally insured patients and patients in my membership-based program, you can clearly see the difference between the people that have insurance and the people that are paying their own way. Because when somebody's paying $1,000 a month for health insurance policy and they twist their knee, you better believe they want an MRI for that knee. Uh, and you're not talking them out of it, okay? So uh, you end up having to have the insurance company then you know, put, the, put the foot down and say, no, we're not gonna let that MRI, but the mentality is different. When somebody else is, when you're paying for your own MRI, you say, look, I can get you an MRI for $175. It's not crazy, but we just don't need it. You shouldn't spend your money on it right now because it's not gonna change your course of care right now. People get that. But when they're paying so much money for the coverage, they want, they want what they're entitled to. So when you have to sell this cheap, affordable primary care, and you have to then bundle that into a very expensive box that includes end-of-life care, includes chemotherapy, includes surgeries. When you have to put that all together and sell it for one, it artificially raises the price of access to primary care. But when you pull everything out just from primary care by itself, you'll see the price would just come crashing down. Uh, and now anybody should be able to walk into the walk into the door of a primary care office and, and not be afraid of the bill that they're going to see there. 
And for most people, probably 80 to 90 percent of what the average person needs in a general year we can accomplish at the level of the primary care doctor. I can treat your high blood pressure, your diabetes, your cholesterol, your heart disease, your asthma. I can, can inject your, your aching joints. I can take off skin cancers, do halter monitors, EKGs. It can all be done in our office and we don't need to send you anywhere for that. So like I said, you know, we have total price transparency. Uh, catastrophic insurance, when you separate it out, now becomes true catastrophic insurance again, covered against a, an unexpected loss. If you look, this is what's included in our typical program. If you look down the right-hand side, you can see we don't charge anything. That column just in the middle there is the price that we typically would charge for somebody that didn't have health insurance. But we include 25 office visits at no additional, no additional charge. That's a visit every other week for a year. I've never seen it happen, but I suppose it's possible. Uh, we include uh, an annual physical for men, they get the prostate cancer screening test, for women they get the PAP tests and the mammograms included in there. Uh, we have the colon cancer screening, we do blood work, all your routine labs are included. Uh, so anything that can be done. We don't exclude for pre-existing conditions, but we make two, two exclusions. We don't prescribe chronic narcotic pain medications and we don't prescribe chronic controlled substances. Uh, and the only reason that is, is if you know about Florida, we have a reputation as a pill mill uh, state, and we don't want to be seen as exchanging cash for drugs. So we just lay that out there at the beginning. We're not going to do it. So to give you, again, an idea of, of the types of procedures that we would typically do and, and what we charge for them, again, the charge is zero for all this stuff. So I can do joint injections, which charge 150, skin biopsies under $200. I can drain your abscess for, you know, typically under $300. Uh, maceration repairs, we don't charge anything for that in the office. And I started reached out to some partners around the community to, to see what they could sell their services for. So we have a list now of specialists that are willing to provide care to our patients if they agree to pay at the time of service. We did not twist arms, we didn't set any prices for anybody, they named all their own prices. And you can see here the types of discounts that people are going to see, and if you're in the back and you can't see that, uh, I have a nuclear stress test for just about $500. A CT scan of the chest with contrast that's $200, about $200. Uh, I get a, a colonoscopy for a little over $1,000. Now that sounds expensive, but if you didn't have insurance, it'd be between four to $5,000. And that colonoscopy includes a surgery center fee, it includes an anesthesiologist fee, the general surgeon's fee, and the pathologist reviewing the slides. So, and you also only need that procedure every 10 years. This is a fun one. You probably aren't going to be able to see this, but uh, I'm just going to tell you that this is an actual hospital bill of a patient of mine that went to the emergency room for abdominal pain. Uh, I'm going to break it down on the next slide so you can see, but this is an itemized bill for every single thing this patient had, every lab test, every CAT scan, uh, every x-ray, and you will see here, uh, I summarize it on this slide, that bill for an office, for a, a ER visit, that patient had a CAT scan, labs, a chest x-ray, uh, they were probably there for about three or four hours, and the bill came to almost $20,000. If instead of that patient going to the emergency room with abdominal pain, they called up and they said, hey, can you see me? Uh, I can usually see patients within the hour. Uh, I can get CAT scans done real time. I can get full stat blood work done just like the ER can. If that same patient had the same exact test, the same exact stuff, came to our office to the ER, they would have paid $278 for the same workup. So $20,000 versus $300. And this is what we charge for that. $80 a month for an individual. We charge $150 a month for a couple. And $175 for a family up to four. Uh, that's cheaper than most people are going to pay for their cell phones. And I can tell you that most of my patients on Medicaid have a cell phone. Um, in fact, they're pretty nice cell phones. <laughs> um, but if you can afford cell phone service, or you can afford, uh, you can afford a cable television at your house. You can afford this. This is not unreasonable for most people. So if you look at, at what this costs versus a, a traditional uh, PPO, if we'll do some math here on some of the cost savings. Let's say we have a family of four, $175 a month. Uh, if you look back in for 2013, the average for a family of four for a traditional PPO policy was about $1,800 per month. 
the difference between the two is $17,000 per year. What I'd like to show you here is how this works out over time. So what I've done is say, okay, this, is, this price down here, this black line, is what somebody would pay if they bought a Epiphany Health membership for their family of four, bought a traditional $10,000 catastrophic high deductible health plan. Okay, so they're paying for two policies. They're paying for ours and they're paying for a high deductible health plan. Versus the traditional PPO cost. So over 10 years, this is the traditional PPO cost, and this number up here, if you could read it, would say about $227,000 over 10 years. Under ours, it would be about $52,000. The net savings for that family of four is about $168,000 over 10 years. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that this is the least healthy family you've ever encountered. And these people hit their $10,000 deductible every single year for 10 years. It can happen. It's not common, but it can happen. So 10 times 10, that's $100,000. We already saved them $168,000. So even if they they hit everything, they're still coming out almost $70,000 ahead at the end of 10 years by paying for their, their services directly. Now we go back to that heating and air conditioning guy and said, okay, let's, let's do this for 10 employees. You're the nicest employer in the world. You're going to pay your $10,000 deductible for all of your employees and every single one of your employees got sick and hit their deductible every single year the entire 10 years. Again, we take that million dollars off of here. We've saved almost $700,000 over 10 years by them bringing their primary care in-house. Uh, we can talk later or separately, but, but by doing that, you can also then self-insure for the catastrophic stuff. And then really, that's where some real cost savings come in. And that's what we're doing for some, some businesses around Florida. How can I do this for so cheap? Well, as I said, this stuff is not as expensive as it was. My costs, I have contracts with two national labs. I buy labs for wholesale and I just pass them through to the patient. My cost on those labs that we promised them is $30. My cost on the mammogram, I buy those mammograms wholesale is $25. I pay $6 for that flu shot I promised them. I pay $28 for that pap smear. Those are all wholesale pricing, no markup at all. And so what I've done basically in the first month is I've covered my overhead expenses, so my costs that I've guaranteed them. So I'm not taking, there's no risk for me. You know, if the patient comes in, pays me for one month, and then disappears off the plan, I've broken even. Okay. So, uh, if you work this out, basically, you don't have to go through all the math, but a, a family doctor that has 500 patients enrolled in this program, after their expenses, would, would, would have about $220,000 in take home, which is probably the in the top 5% of what a primary care doctor makes. Now, if you include that as a hybrid, like we do, we add it to our existing practices, then this is just extra extra revenue for the struggling primary care doctor. If you can't struggle from that, I don't know what. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that by adding this program to our practice, we've been doing this since the beginning of 2010. Uh, as you probably know, or independent practices basically are becoming dinosaurs. All of the practices are being gobbled up by large corporations, hospitals. Uh, I am practicing in Southwest Florida, Southern Sarasota County. Uh, I am the last independent practice in my community. They're all gone. I'm the only one left. And this is the only reason why we're able to do that. So if you look at the Affordable Care Act and say that the, the plan was that we're going to have 32 million people now with insurance. A lot of those are going to be on Medicaid, and I can tell you in my area, the closest doctor that takes new adult Medicaid patients is about an hour and a half to two hours away from my, from my practice. Uh, I can't find any specialists to take care of patients. That's primary care. But they have the insurance. They're covered. Uh, but the assumption is, is that we're going to leave 26 million people uninsured. I mean, that was the baseline assumption in passing this law, that we will still have a problem where these people are uninsured. Unfortunately, now all the safety nets are going away, now, <laughs> uh, not that you've implemented these other things. but. Uh, the present CBO score of that is $1.8 trillion, and it keeps changing and keeps going up. But right now, the latest numbers I've seen are $1.8 trillion. Let's, instead of doing that, instead of giving coverage to everybody, let's give care to everybody. And we'll take all 58 million people that were uninsured, and we'll sign them up for an Epiphany Health Program. We'll just give them the basic stuff that they need. The cost on that would be $558 billion, with a net savings of $1.2 trillion over 10 years. And now we've covered and cared for everybody. Right. With that sort of savings, 
I mean, you could very easily put together some sort of public safety net. Uh, let's just say this were Medicaid. Uh, you could very easily have a direct primary care Medicaid practice where you then have Medicaid as a high deductible health plan that wraps around it to save them for catastrophic purposes. But this is the kind of money you're, you're dealing with that you have in savings from, uh, from the status quo. So this is, again, this is something we've been doing since 2010. So this is not uh, new. I mean, this is definitely a sustainable program for us. People say it can't be done. Uh, I've been working with the senator up in the state of Michigan to create a pilot program that does allow Medicaid primary home direct primary care with a high deductible health plan Medicaid wraparound. Uh, and so we're, we're working on legislation for that. Uh, and one of the things that, that he says that I always appreciate is that but if all the people that, that keep saying that this can't be done, they get out of the way of the people that are actually doing it, uh, we, can, we might be able to get something accomplished. Uh, you know, this is something that, no matter whom I've talked to, uh, seems to be universally accepted, uh, appreciated, no matter what side of the, the aisle you're on. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. When we were up in Washington, uh, we were calling on members of Congress. We had about 100 physicians who were standing in front of the Capitol. And we're all in our white coats, and I'm wearing a button that says, Ask me about health care reform. And look next to me, and there were 1,500 nurses all wearing red shirts with, with uh, uh, the union emblem on the front and on the back that said, Health care for everybody, send the bill to Wall Street. And we were all waiting for a ride, and, and it didn't take long for them to realize we were both there for the same re reason and had completely different visions on how to get there. And one of the nurses came up to me and said, well, What? What are you here for? I said, well, we're here to talk to Congress about uh, free market solutions to health care. Uh, and, and she said, how would you do that? I said, oh, through high deductible health plans, health savings accounts, and uh, direct primary care to provide affordable care. And she said, oh, so if you don't have health insurance and if you're not rich, you die in the street. Okay. Um, I pulled out my brochure and I said, no, actually, for, more than, for less than you pay for your cell phone, we can provide all the care you need, your mammogram, your pet test, your blood work, 25 office visits and you'll pay about $80 a month for it. She said, this is fantastic. <laughs> uh, and she took it back and shared it with all her friends. Uh, about a month ago, I was at a, a health fair at Sarasota at a college. And we had a booth, we were trying to recruit some of the parents, some of the, of the kids in, the, in this class. And the Affordable Care Act navigators also had a booth there. And one of the navigators came up and she saw my sign and said, no health insurance, no problem, affordable direct primary care. And she said, what is this? And I explained you know, a little bit about our program. And I said, you know, you realize that Florida didn't expand Medicaid, right? And she said, yes. And I said, well, those people that fall between 100 to 138 percent of, of the federal poverty level, they don't have, they, they're not subsidized. They have to pay full price for those policies. They're the ones that least can afford it. So we're taking care of those people because they're all signing up for our, our health plan. They're paying their way under that program. She said, well, that's, that's Wonderful. And I said, yes. And I said, and if people do sign up for your plans, they have a $6,000 deductible and they can't afford to get health care in your program. She said, I know it's awful. I said, yes, it is awful. <laughs> uh, I said, but you know, we're going to take care of them too. Uh, and so they actually took a huge stack of our flyers and they're going around town. When people aren't, are signing up for the Affordable Care Act, they're giving them our brochure uh, to supplement the high deductible health plans they're selling on the, on the insurance exchange. So with that, I'll open it up to, uh, to any questions or comments. Uh, I didn't really get into sort of the business aspect and how it works with small businesses, but I can't. Work. What does this do to your errors and emissions insurance? What does it do what to my? What does this do to your errors and emissions insurance? Uh, this has. I, the question was, what does it do to my insurance? Like, as my my new now insurance? Yeah. It, it hasn't touched it. I, I can also say, from a from a financial standpoint, last month when we did our finances, and if I looked at, at what my patient contacts were versus what my revenue was. This accounted for 10% of my patient volume, my clinic volume, but 50% of my take-home revenue. Yeah. This sounds wonderful, but it also sounds like it would make the hospital lobby very nervous because um, you would have to have, I imagine, in your facility, um, stress test equipment, MRI equipment, um, mammogram equipment, all the things that here in Georgia requires a CON, which uh, interferes with the free market in healthcare. Um, do you have that problem there in Florida, and do you have that kind of stuff in your practice? Uh, what we've done is we've reached out to. Like, the question was, you know, are we competing with the hospital? How is the hospital supporting this? Uh, does a certificate of need come into play because you might have to have 
certain imaging equipment, mammography in your, in your office to do it as in Georgia. Uh, what we've done is we've contracted with independent, independent uh, imaging centers. So we, we don't bring that stuff in house. We contract with somebody else that already has that service available. Uh, so that's, that's not really an issue. Uh, it just so happens I'm on the board of trustees of my hospitals. So that's not been an issue. Uh, they're extremely supportive of what we're doing. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the hospital is, for us, the, truly the, the deep abyss of healthcare for dollars. Uh, I would sit down you know, as a business owner trying to negotiate a rates with the hospital. And when I, I sat down with the chief financial officer of our hospital, again, I'm on the board, I sat down with the chief financial officer and I said, if I tell a patient to go to the emergency room and they have no health insurance, what, am I, what sort of financial commitment have I just made for that patient? Just give me a ballpark. Is it $1,000? Is it $20,000? If somebody calls me up at midnight and says, I have chest pain, and I say, go to the ER, what have I just done to that person? And they can't tell you. And I said, well, just give me a ballpark. And it's, it's different. It depends on the codes. It depends on the so I'll give you specifics. Patient comes in with chest pain, you give them three tablets of nitroglycerin, you do a chest x-ray, an EKG, uh, you do three sets of blood tests, keep them for, for 24 hours, and give them a turkey sandwich. What is that going to cost? <laughs> It's like we weren't even speaking the same language. I mean, you just you can't get there from here. Um, so that's been our frustrations with, with, with the hospital. But it's not that they haven't been supportive. In fact, uh, with the new 30-day readmission rates, where the hospitals don't get uh, don't get paid for readmissions if a patient gets sent out, um, they're really interested in our program for people that don't have insurance and saying, you know what, we're going to take some of our people that keep balancing back, and we're going to go ahead and send them your way. Um, and so they've actually been referring us patients. Uh, I can tell you that when the county health department, when the Affordable Care Act went live, the county primary care clinic lost its funding because it wasn't a federally qualified health center. Uh, and when they closed, they sent all their patients to us. Uh, and it's interesting because the federally qualified health center was down the street was furious that, that the health department would send people to a private entity to get, to get care. But they're doing it. They're paying their own land. They're coming off the public assistance. In the back, you can hand up for a bit. Yes. Um, realizing that you probably handle a lot in-house in your primary care practice, have you been successful in negotiating um, rates with specialists such as ENT, non-op, uh, ortho, things that you know maybe aren't uh, don't have other fees added in, but um, where you need to refer uh, for for fairly simple things but are out of the scope of primary care? Yeah, we're, we're presently under contract with cardiology, orthopedics, uh, gastroenterology, rheumatology, nephrology, uh, physical therapy. We have four pharmacies under contract, uh, two national labs, and two imaging centers. Okay. That's awesome. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, is there a voice for mid-level providers with what you're doing? Uh, we presently don't have any mid-levels in what we're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's just sort of our practice model. It is yeah. not that I have anything against mid levels, that's the one thing that sort of separates us from the, the the big group up the road that they're they're all about volume and running people through as fast as possible. So we sort of say, you know, we'll see, you'll see your physician today, uh, no waiting and you know, so that's just sort of our marketing niche. But I, there's certainly a role for mid levels in, in this model, there's no question about it. And, and in fact there's a PA uh, that has launched their own, their own uh, direct care practice uh, not too far from here. I have my own um, house calls practice. Okay. I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm in the level. Yeah. But it's a uh, constant house calls. Awesome. Yes. Lee, what about travel? I mean, would this act as insurance if, the, if your member is elsewhere in the country, they're out on vacation? How does that work? Yeah. Um, no, it, it, I mean, again, this is not insurance. Uh, I can tell you that as the model grows, there will certainly be reciprocity of practices that should take care of somebody else that's traveling. Um, you know, so if somebody's a member of the of a direct primary care, somebody else will see them if they're if they're out of the area. Um, but you know, it's not going to cover them. But you know, if you see, if you're going to attend the next session with uh, Josh Umber from Atlas MD from Wichita, Kansas, uh, they do a lot of telemedicine. Um, so you can do a lot of stuff with Skype and, and emails and those sorts of things. Uh, I'm not presently doing that, um, but you know, because what I've done is, is I've created a hybrid model. I've just added this to my existing practice. And I'll tell you, it's, it's not easy to set that up because if you don't do it properly, you're undercutting Medicare, you're, 
you're invalidating insurance contracts, so you really have to be careful of how you set it up if you're going to do a hybrid. If you're going to do like Dr. Josh did, just say, it, you're in or you're out. You know, either you join the program or you're not part of the practice, then you have flexibility. Your, your patient volume is much, much less, but you can do a lot more. And there, there are others doing this sort of thing around the country, so we foresee eventually doing agreements and sharing reciprocity, as you said. I think that's, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah, and uh, the company that probably did the first direct care uh, was out in Seattle, Washington, at least the one that took it mainstream, a company called q uh, In fact, they're the ones that are responsible for putting the language in the Affordable Care Act that allows direct primary care to be sold with a wraparound health insurance policy on the exchange. And q is the only company that actually did sell policies on the exchange this year with the rollout. And if you look at the health care policies in Seattle, Washington, and you look at the the policies that Q-Lions sold, which is direct primary care with a wraparound, so it's it's all things included. It's compliant with the new law. Uh, they were easily 40% cheaper than the next most expensive insurance plan, easily. Well, I take it from that then that your program is uh, qualified under the terms of the ACA? By itself, it is not qualified under the ACA. We don't meet the minimum essential coverage provisions, uh, but if you have a wraparound insurance policy, then it's compliant. So our, and I'll wrap up, our biggest, I think our biggest challenge right now in sort of growing this is it's getting harder and harder to find true catastrophic insurance. And what you see of these high deductible health plans in the ACA, they're high deductible health plans but with a bunch of stuff stuffed in them that nobody wants. Uh, so you're paying for a lot of stuff that you don't need. And so a true catastrophic policy, a true $6,000 that doesn't cover first dollar expenses with that wrap around this, is really what we need to, to really take this mainstream. Plus, uh, some favorable legislation at the state levels as well. Uh, we're right now working on this with the state of Florida, getting legislation passed that clearly defines the role of direct primary care as not being health insurance. Because the last thing we need is you know the health insurance company to come out and say you're operating an illegal insurance company. Should be. Uh, well, we're clearly not providing insurance. It's not what we do. Um, but that's been the accusation that, you know, that this is a, an insurance operation. So we're clarifying that because it's a gray zone within the legislation um, that we do we fall under the Board of Medicine for regulation, not the insurance regulations. One more question. I talked to a doctor in Thompson, Georgia, about this, and she said that she has she has a lot of Medicare patients, and her concern was this would be a violation of Medicare laws. And said, like you referenced a little bit of that, you can't charge people less than what charge Medicare, how do you get around that? We don't enroll Medicare patients in our program. Okay. When you turn 65, for your traditional Medicare fee for service in our, in our program. Uh, if you're in Atlas MD, uh, you're not billing Medicare. It's, you're, he's, you're opted out, so you don't have to follow the rules. It's, but as a Medicare provider, I cannot take a penny from Medicare outside of the Medicare system for something that Medicare covers. So,